Hi everybody, welcome to the Parallel Systems Broadcast. I'm your host Mike, thank you for tuning in to tonight's very special episode. Now tonight's show is the first episode in a series that I'm going to be doing, especially for the channel that I've entitled The Road to Ruin. Now this series is sponsored by my patrons, so a big thank you to them for helping ensure that content like this can be created. So like I said, it's going to be called The Road to Ruin. And in this series, we're going to be looking back at some of history's worst financial catastrophes. And the reason we're going to be doing this is to help better understand what took us down this road to ruin that we are now on. But similarly, this is not just going to be a history lesson because what this series is really about is about finding out not just what led to past financial crises, but also the impacts that it had on the everyday man and woman. And what I want us all to take away from this series is some really practical knowledge that is relevant today, such as how did people survive a hyperinflation or financial collapse? What skills did they need? What did they use for trade and barter? What did it take for them to survive? So I think you're going to find this series extremely interesting, but also very useful as well for preparing yourself and your family for the financial catastrophe that now awaits us all. Now, having said that, tonight's first episode in the series is going to be not exploring a hyperinflation, but exploring something that happened in the build-up to a hyperinflation. And that was one of history's first and worst financial bubbles that took place in 18th century France under John Law. Now, the reason I wanted to explore this specific catastrophe with you all is because there's so many parallels between what has happened here in the West since 2008 and what happened in John Law's France. We have repeated all of the same catastrophic mistakes that led to a financial catastrophe in France. Now, what we'll find as we go through tonight's episode is that in many ways, our central bankers today have just refined the practices that they perfected with John Law in France. They literally took the playbook from 1700s France and applied it to the West, only they did it on a global scale now. So, of course, the consequences are going to be far, far worse. Now, you might have heard this story before, but I certainly don't think you will have heard the take on it that I'm going to be giving you tonight because I uncovered many things in my own research that I have never heard anyone else discuss before. In fact, oftentimes when you hear people retell the story of John Law's France, it's very clinical. It's about a man who goes to France, he destroys the economy, and then he leaves. It's very, very basic, and it does not include the greater narrative as to what has happened over the past 2,000 years in terms of central banking and banking cartels. Now, if you know your history on banking, you'll know that it all began in Venice in the 1300s when we had a number of banking families get together and create a cabal. There was the Committee of Ten, and then they started expanding out into Europe, getting the monarchs indebted, getting nations heavily indebted to enact debt slavery. And then they took over the nation's money supply with central banks. Now, if you understand that story, then all of a sudden there's lots of things in the story of John Law that simply do not add up. I'm going to lay out tonight what I think was really going on and then provide my evidence towards it. And you can make up your own minds as to whether the official story is true or whether you think my story is true. So before we get to what happened between 1716 and 1720 in France, we need to go back just a few steps before this to understand what preceded the Mississippi bubble. Now, during those years, France was ruled by King Louis XIV. He was the longest reigning monarch in European history. He reigned for over 72 years before his death in 1715. But he was really a catastrophe for the French nation. He left the economy in absolute tatters. He was in war almost constantly during his reign. There was the War of the Spanish Succession, which ended in a draw but simply bankrupted the country. He built massive, massive palaces, the Palace of Versailles, for example. And of course, they were very, very happy to lend Louis XIV money. In fact, they were the same families that were instigating the wars of Europe to get the monarchs to lend so much money. And why would they want to do that? Well, it's very simple, isn't it? If somebody is indebted to you, then you are a slave unto them. If you can get an entire nation indebted to you, then you can control that nation. The politics, the industry, you get all the power. So the banking cartels were lending as much money as possible to France, the same way they did with the Dutch, and of course the same way they did with the British, which we'll get to in a moment. Now at the time of his death, Louis XIV left debts of 2,800 million livres, which was an astronomical figure back then. It was about four or five times the debt of most comparable nations of Europe. And of that debt, 1,068 million livres 
was issued in perpetual bonds. Now, what I mean by that is they were selling government debt with a token on there, a bond, an interest rate that must be paid to the bondholder, and that interest rate was paid forever. An absolute catastrophe for the nation of France. He also left behind 920 million in floating debt. So this was debt that had yet to be resolved. And there was an interest rate that the French nation had to continually pay until they paid back the principal on that debt. Now, to give you a better understanding of just how dire the fiscal situation in France was at the time of Louis XIV's death, France had 2,800 million livres of debt. However, they was only bringing in a revenue of 166 million livres per year. And out of that, they had to spend 118 million livres just to keep the state functioning. So they had 48 million livres left over to service the debt. However, the debt they needed to service was 86.5 million livres. So 48 million livres to service debt of 86.5 million livres. Of course, the maths doesn't add up. Now, that's not even taking into account the additional 40 million livres of floating debt, which had a 4% interest rate attached to it. So when you put that together, that is a catastrophic financial situation. And that's before you even get to repaying the capital. We're talking here just about debt service. Now remember, back in the 1700s, debts were paid in gold and silver. France was on a hard metal standard. You couldn't just print the money to pay back your debt like they do today. So this was the situation that France was in in 1715. It was really not in a good shape. Then all of a sudden, around that time, a man arrives out of nowhere. And that man was Mr. John Law. And he was about to change everything in France. And it was going to have catastrophic consequences for every man, woman and child in that country. So who is John Law? Well, John Law was born in Scotland. He was born the son of a Scottish goldsmith. Now, a goldsmith back then was pretty much a banker. Remember, gold was money. So if you was involved in gold, if you was a goldsmith, for example, then you was almost certainly involved with the bankers. Now, his father was very high up. He was a nobleman. He had a massive estate in Scotland. He was a title holder. So, of course, he will have been involved with the elites of the day. And Scotland was a very important location for many reasons. Now, unfortunately for John Law, his father died when he was 14 years old. And John Law inherited this vast estate and a significant amount of wealth. Now, what we know about John Law's early life is that he was a gambler, a speculator, and he traveled around taking part in lots of high stakes gambling. He also went to study at the School of Economics down in London, and he started to write his own treatise on economics. Now, one of the most interesting points about John Law is that in 1695, he actually murdered a man. He killed a man in the street in a duel, and he was arrested and found guilty of murder. Of course, the usual punishment for this would either have been death or lifetime imprisonment. However, John Law got a pardon for that murder. He was pardoned for it. Now, who would be able to pardon you for a murder? Well, that would only be the king or the queen at the time. So here's where it gets very interesting. Who was the king and queen of England back in 1695? Well, that would have been William and Mary of Orange, who you'll remember were the king and queen of the Netherlands. However, the bankers organized a coup. And they managed to overthrow King James II in the UK. And they promised William and Mary they would put them on the throne under one condition. And that condition, of course, was to allow them to take control over the nation's monetary supply. You see, they knew that no matter who was on the throne of a country, if you control the nation's money supply, you was the real ruler of that country. And William and Mary agreed to it. And having overthrown King James II, what happened? Two years later, the Bank of England opened its doors. So what this tells us is that from the very beginning, John Law had friends in very high places. He certainly had some powerful people behind him, rooting for him, helping him out, maybe directing him. Why do we know that? Well, like I said, he was found guilty of murder, but then he received a royal pardon. And who was in control of the royal family in the UK at that time? Why, that would have been the Venetian bankers, the same bankers who instituted the first central bank in Europe, which was the Bank of Amsterdam. So I want you to keep that in mind as we go through the story that right from the very start, there's some interesting anomalies about this story, some things that don't quite add up. And I'm going to draw this all together as we go through the story. Now, we know from the history books that having left the UK, John Law spent an awful lot of time in Venice, Genoa, 
and Amsterdam. Now, why is that significant? Well, we know from history that from the 1300s onwards, the most powerful banking clans grew up out of Venice, Genoa, and then eventually they got to make the first central bank in Europe in 1609 in Amsterdam. So John Law was spending time in the most powerful banking circles in Europe. Now the history books say that John Law was a playboy and he was just out speculating and gambling. However, make no mistake, if you're in Venice, if you're in Genoa, if you're in Amsterdam, if you're a goldsmith's son, you are certainly involving yourself in some of the most powerful banking families in Europe. So that's something we're gonna come back to later in the show, but it's important to note that these three locations are all extremely significant when it comes to the history of banking in Europe. Now in 1715, John Law finally arrives in France. This is the same year, as you'll remember, that King Louis XIV died. Now John Law immediately embedded himself in the highest echelons of society and he became very good friends with the most powerful man in the country very quickly. Again, awfully suspicious. Remember, John Law was just the son of a goldsmith. Yes, he came from a noble family, but he certainly wasn't in the very upper echelons of society. He was just landed gentry, but he immediately got himself an audience with who was at the time the most powerful man in the country. Now, let me explain. After King Louis XIV died, the next person in line for the throne was his grandson, but his grandson was only five years old. So in the interim, there was a prince regent, and this was the Duke of Orleans, who was the brother of the king. And that is exactly who John Law became very, very good friends with. Now, he submitted his proposals immediately based on John's economic theories that he had been coming up with for a paper-backed system. He wanted to get rid of gold and silver and start to use paper because he believed that the paper currency would stimulate the economy, get people back to work, and bail France out of its awful economic situation. Now, this might be starting to sound quite familiar. Where have we heard this before? Increasing the money supply will increase growth. That's exactly the same ideology that the central bankers today have. So what was John's proposal? Well, it was to create a central bank. Now, John Law ultimately managed to convince the regent to allow him to set up a national bank. However, this was thrown out by the government at the time and he was forced to instead open up a smaller and purely private bank, but that didn't last long. Now, Law immediately set about creating paper money when he opened his bank and the money was initially backed by gold and silver. Now, getting the notes to circulate was John Law's next task. He wanted everyone to be using this paper money in France. So what John Law started to do was to create propaganda. That's always the way to start, isn't it? So he started to tell people that you can redeem these notes any time for gold and silver, but carrying notes in your pocket is much safer. It's much easier to carry. You don't have to carry coins in a bag. And of course, gradually people start to come around to the idea. Now, another thing that John Law did to try and encourage the country to start using the banknotes was he got tax collectors to accept payments in notes rather than coins. Now, of course, as soon as you start forcing people to pay their taxes in a currency, by default, those people then have to hold that currency exactly like today. You might not like fiat money, but you need to pay your taxes in it. So of course, you have to use it. Now, the result was that the bank was very quickly able to issue a large amount of notes. We're talking 40 to 50 million livres of notes per year on average. And they was backing this at the time by 50% in species, that's gold and silver. So to begin with, everything looked okay. The notes were in circulation, that was backed by gold and silver, but of course we all know how this story goes. The moment you give the state the monopoly on money and allow them to print paper money that they claim is backed by gold and silver, what happens? Of course, they start to print more money than they can back in gold and silver. That's the way this story always goes. That's exactly what started to happen in France. Now, impressed with the early success of the private bank in 1718, John Law was finally given his wish and allowed to convert the private bank into the central bank of the country. By then, it had 39.5 million livres in circulation and the notes were circulating at par and they were trusted by the populace at that point. People were finding the system was working. They were converting their currency from paper to species if they wanted to. Of course, the goal was to ensure that they didn't do this because what John Law wanted to do was to push gold and silver out of the system and make a completely fiat system. 
Now, as the paper notes became more and more accepted and demand for it grew, John Law realized that at some point this scheme was gonna fall apart because they were not gonna be able to back all of the new currency that they was printing with gold and silver. So John Law came up with an idea and he saw an opportunity in the new world, which was of course the Americas, where France had a colony in Louisiana. So Law set up a trading company called Compagnie d'Occident, which was the company of the West. And the goal of the company was to go out to Louisiana to set up a colony and to start extracting riches and wealth and bringing that back to France too. Now this idea to set up a company and start developing a foreign colony that was owned by France was a common arrangement by European kings and queens at the time. That's how they developed their colonies in the Americas and other parts of the world like Africa. What they would do is they would grant rights, exclusive rights to a private entrepreneur or company and then they would get the monopoly rights on that colony to go out out and ensure it was profitable mining for gold and silver and gems, enslaving the local populace, bringing back slaves. That is exactly what was happening. So this is what John Law proposed he would do. Now to get people to go across to the new colony and start working out there, John Law would tempt them with things like land and promises of riches. However, eventually people started to say, well, I'm not really too interested in that because remember Louisiana was a dangerous place. It was a big massive swamp. People had nice lives back there in France, the noblemen and noble women, the middle class people, they were doing all right. So in the end, John Law started to take people off the street, the working class, the peasants, he would just kidnap them, throw them on a ship and send them across to Louisiana. Eventually, he even started to empty out the prisoners. He was taking people out of prison, marrying them off immediately to a prostitute and then sticking them together on a ship and sailing them across. And that's how he developed the territory. So that gives you an idea of just how ruthless a man John Law could be. Now, of course, to fund all of this, the new operations in Louisiana, to continue paying the debts of France, John Law needed more and more money. And he started selling shares of the company, like I said. Now, because of John Law's own expertise as a speculator and a gambler, he understood how to seduce people with the promise of riches, how to earn 15 times your money, 20 times your money, 30 times your money. And he became a very good salesman for the Mississippi Company. And he convinced the people to start buying into the dream. Now keep in mind John Law's central bank was printing the money that people were now using to invest in shares of the company that he run. So all of a sudden you had this symbiotic relationship and this feedback loop where the fiat money that was being printed was then being used to prop up the share price of the Mississippi company. Again, this should be starting to sound awfully familiar. This was a primitive version of quantitative easing. What we have seen over the past decade, the central banks creating lots of money, and where has that money gone to? Well, of course, it's gone straight into the stock market, propping up asset prices and making it seem like everything is A-OK. -okay. People were seeing returns on their equities portfolio, their house price was going up, their pension was looking good, but all of the money was being printed by the central banks. That is what kept all of this going. Well, that's exactly what John Law was doing in the 1700s in France. Now, John Law wasn't done there. He then added another element to his Fiat Ponzi scam because that's exactly what it was. And he started to trade the shares of the company for government bonds, eventually acquiring a substantial amount of France's debt. Now, of course, the reason he did this was to monetize the debt. So you had the fiat notes that were being monetized as though they were of value, but they were debt. You had the government debt, the public debt, and you also had the shares for the company, which was another form of debt. So there was three debt instruments that John Law had thrown into this feedback loop, and all of them were propping each other up. That is a fiat Ponzi system. Now, that's the same system we've got today. We've got debt-based money, propping up a debt-based system. And the money that is printed then goes to companies and it props up the share prices. And the share prices make people believe that they're gonna get a return on their investment. So at this point, John Law had complete control over France's money system. And really the system now had two unique elements. You had the fiat monetary system that John Law had created where he was printing banknotes that were not really backed by gold or silver anymore. And then he had this company, the Mississippi company, where he was issuing shares and people were using the fiat money to buy the shares. Then on top of that, you had the government that had this relationship with both because he was using both the fiat money and the shares of the company to buy government debt. So now there was this unholy trinity that had formed between the Bank General, which then became the Royal Bank, the Mississippi Company, and the government. 
and it was just a debt-based Ponzi scheme where all pillars of this system were supporting one another. Of course, that could only work for so long because at some point people were going to realize that there was nothing backing the money, that they couldn't redeem it for gold or silver, that it was just a fiat system and that the promises for the Mississippi company were never going to be delivered. Now, of course, with all of this hot money flooding into this Mississippi company, the share values skyrocketed. In 1719 alone, the price rose almost 2,000% in a single year, which is what happens when you have an essentially unlimited amount of money being used to buy up the shares. Now, this is no different to what has happened since 2008. All of the quantitative easing was being used to make asset purchases. All of that money was being used to bolster up the stock market to keep those asset prices high. Similarly, interest rates were taken down as low as possible and that enabled companies to take cheap credit and use that money to buy back their own shares. Now, this is again something that was happening in John Law's France as we will speak about later in today's show. Now, I thought it would be useful to give you a little rundown of the share issuances of the Mississippi company from its inception all the way to the end of 1719. So it began in June 1717 when they did an IPO, an initial placement offering. Now you'll know this because the same thing happens today. When a company is about to go onto the stock market, they do an IPO where people can invest in shares of that company before it actually is listed on the stock market. Now the IPO for the Mississippi company involved 200,000 shares, which were being sold for 500 livres each and that was payable in government bonds. So that meant that anybody who owned a government bond could convert that into shares in the new company, the Mississippi company, for 500 livres each. Now in June 1719, another 50,000 shares were issued, this time at 550 livres each, and you could buy these with cash. However, they enabled people to put down just 50 livres and pay the rest in 20 monthly installments. So. Even back in the 1700s, we had this idea of buying on margin. They allowed people to speculate. So they were starting to draw in all of the middle classes and working classes. Even if you couldn't afford a share in the company, if you had 50 livres, you could buy a share and pay the rest back to them with interest over 20 monthly installments. So you're really starting to see here the making of a Ponzi scheme. We've seen all of the same things take place over the past 20, 30 years. Right now, we've got more people buying on margin than ever before. Now, just a month later in July, 1719, another 50,000 shares were issued, only this time at 1,000 livres each. So we've gone from 550 to 1,000 in just a month. And again, they allowed people to buy this in cash. So this would be in gold and silver, all the paper banknotes. And again, they could pay in 20 monthly installments. Now listen to this one. Just another two months later in September, of 1719, 300,000 shares were issued. 300,000 shares were issued at 5,000 livres. Again, it was payable in cash or you could pay this time in 10 monthly installments. So just think about that for a second. From June 1719 to September 1719, there was three separate share issuances. The first lot was at 550 livres and the final lot was at 5,000 livres. That's a tenfold increase in three months. So you can see here the speculative mania. From June to September, it sucked in so many people. They were seeing this share price go up and up and up and there was a massive demand for it. So they got away with issuing more and more. And of course, the share price kept going up because all of this funny money was now going into the Mississippi company. Now, of course, John Law knew exactly what was going to happen because he understood that he'd inflated a huge bubble. He knew that the money was backed by nothing and he understood the Ponzi scheme that he'd created because he understood that there was this huge bubble with an artificially high price and that some people were going to start to pull their money out of the system. Remember, John Law had managed to convince not just the working and middle classes, but also many of the upper classes to invest in his company. These very wealthy people and those people had made 10x. They were involved at the initial stage. So now they were starting to think, right, I've made an awful lot of money. 
Maybe I'm gonna to start to pull my money out and turn it back into gold and silver. These were clever people who knew that real assets were the most important thing. They didn't want to keep the paper money. They were happy to keep their gold and silver in their vault. So people started to change their paper notes and sell some of their shares to convert it back to species. And John Law understood that there was simply not enough gold and silver to cover anything like the amount of claims that were now on them. So of course, John Law had to start to restrict how people could use gold and silver to try and stop them from going back into it. So having looked at the timeline of share issuances, now let's look at the timeline of how John Law attacked the coinage to ensure people couldn't use it. So on January the 28th, 1720, notes were given legal tender throughout France. On February the 27th, 1720, it was made illegal for anyone to own more than 500 livres in gold or silver coins. Illegal to own more than 500 livres in gold or silver. So you can see that very quickly, he started to tighten the screw. This paper money went from being voluntary just a few years before to now all of a sudden being something that people were forced to use. And gold and silver was now being criminalized. And by April of that year, all gold and silver clauses in contracts were now voided. Then just a month later on May the 1st, it was announced that it would be illegal for anybody to own gold or silver. Yes, John Law made it illegal for anybody to have gold and silver. So now people were completely trapped in the system. And this is something that I've been talking a lot about on my channel. As fiat Ponzi systems start to die, the governments will do anything within their power to keep it going. And oftentimes, one of the things that they do is confiscate gold. Now you'll know, if you've been watching my channel, I recently wrote a guide about how to avoid a gold confiscation. And this is one of the reasons why, if you look back throughout history, they always come for the gold at some point because they need to try and keep their Ponzi scheme going as long as possible. And to do that, they want to trap everyone within that system. Now they've got even more incentive today, of course, because they are trying to force us into a CBDC. And to do that, they need to make sure you have no escape hatch. So if you're interested in trying to avoid a gold confiscation, I really advise that you read my work. You can sign up to my Patreon and you can read that one over there if you are interested. So clearly by 1720, everything had changed. The share price had started to stall. People were trying to pull the money out of the system. They wanted to go back to gold and silver. He was trying to trap them in it. And all of a sudden, the risk off sentiment had gone to risk on. And people started to become very worried that maybe they wasn't gonna see their money back because now gold and silver was outlawed. People were suspicious. And law had printed more than five times the amount of paper money than they actually had in gold reserves. So clearly, there was nowhere near enough money in the vault to cover all of the claims that now existed. And John Law was just simply monetizing debt. People were all running around with debt tokens, but there was nothing backing the debt. And of course, the parallels here are absolutely striking to today. Just like today in 1720, you had lots of people running around, they had high paper gains, but there was nothing backing those gains. There was no actual money backing. It was all just debt instruments that had gone up in value on paper. But as soon as they started to trade out of that, the system started to freeze up. Well, that's exactly what has happened today. We've got lots of people who have seen big increases in their share prices, their pension prices, their house prices, but it's backed by nothing of real value. The only thing that is true money, of course, is gold and silver. And if you had to try and back the current system with gold and silver, you'd need a gold price of probably over $100,000 per ounce now. It's simply not gonna happen, is it? So the moment people pull their money out of the system today, if people started to withdraw their bank deposits to sell their shares, what would happen? The whole system would fall apart within hours. They would freeze up people's banks. They'd freeze up selling in the stock market and you'd be trapped in the system. You wouldn't be able to get your money out. So we're in exactly the same situation now as people were in John Law's France in 1720. The system at the time looked like it was still secure, but in truth, there was nothing backing the system. The system was completely fragile. And the moment people started to pull their money out, the whole thing started to fall apart very, very quickly. So how did it all end? How did it all end? Well, of course, the share price of the Mississippi company was completely artificial. And as soon as people started to pull their money, the whole thing fell apart. The share price fell from 10,000 livres all the way back to 500 livres. France's economy was now in tatters. There was nothing backing the money and people started to realize that the paper money was absolutely worthless. Inflation became chronic and John Law was forced to flee the country. 
Now, the system of course was then in absolute tatters and it took many, many years to resolve this because there were so many people that owed money to other people, but there was no stable financial system. So it was a real financial crisis. Many people lost it all, particularly the working and middle classes who had invested lots of money in the bubble at a later stage. Of course, they thought they were gonna see big profits. Now, they were bankrupt. So of course, everyone that got caught up in this speculative mania lost it all. People put their life savings into this company. People had been taking out loans to speculate and buy shares of this company. All those people that had been seeing these really big nominal gains in the years prior, now all of a sudden had nothing. And not only that, the paper money itself was worthless. So only the people that had kept their money in gold and silver survived. Now that one's critical. That one's critical. Like I said, John Law told people it was outlawed, but soon enough, the system fell apart. So like I said, John Law was forced to flee France and I believe that John Law left having achieved exactly what he actually set out to achieve. I don't think what happened in France, I don't think his Ponzi scheme was a mistake. Now before going any further, let's just have one last look at John Law because like I said, in my own research, I just highlighted many things that simply did not add up. The story itself doesn't make no sense. John Law arrives in France in 1715 and just a few years later, he has bankrupted the entire country again, having already been bankrupted by the previous king. Only this time, he managed to pull out all of the gold and silver from the citizens and convert it to fiat money. Now that really doesn't add up. John Law was not the most powerful man in Europe. He was just a regular man. However, he managed to get himself pardoned from a murder in Great Britain. Then he managed to spend time in the most powerful banking centers of Europe. And then all of a sudden he arrives in France just at the right time. And he manages to immediately get himself an audience with the most powerful man in the country. And sure enough, John Law has the solution to all of his problems and he is promptly able to implement them. Of course, it leads to a massive crisis and then France is bankrupted even further. It's even higher in debt than it was just a few years earlier when King Louis XIV died. And what are the consequences of all this? Well, of course, France now has to turn to the merchant bankers of Europe and start taking out even more loans to try and fix the mess. That's exactly what happened having had John Law in the country. France was now completely beholden to the bankers. And this is really what kicked France off on that path to the French Revolution that happened later in the century. So this is a very important period of history for many reasons. And it's also gonna be intrinsic to understand this part of history for the next episode where we're gonna talk about that brutal and bloody French Revolution and the hyperinflation that ensued. So let's just have one final reflection on this character, John Law. It's a very interesting story. It doesn't quite make sense. I think it only makes sense if you look at the arc of what was happening in Europe at the time. You had these banking elites trying to establish central banks in countries, trying to impoverish the kings and queens of Europe. And John Law appears to me to be one of those people who appears just at the right time. And he's been involved in all of the places where you would expect somebody who was involved with the banking elite to be situated. We're talking Venice, Genoa and Amsterdam. So I think we can be fairly certain that John Law was not acting alone in his imposition of this fiat monetary system on France. John Law will have been working at the behest of other wealthy banking families. That was not John Law's business. John Law came from a Scottish family. His dad was a goldsmith, but he certainly didn't have the power to go into France and transform it, to get himself off with murder. There's just too many stories here. In fact, if you read this story today, you'd say, oh, that guy was almost certainly intelligence. And you can tell that from the unlikely events that happened and the people and circles that he managed to get in with. So it's almost certain, in my opinion, that John Law was working for the Venetian and Genoan banking elite. And the goal, of course, would have been to tie up the French nation even further in debt and get them further beholden to the bankers of Europe. And that's exactly what happened because having had this happen to them, they had to take extraordinary amounts of loans from the Swiss bankers, the German bankers, the Italian bankers. And of course, these were all one and the same. All of the families of Europe, the banking elite was now stemming from Venice and Genoa. And of course, we know that because our own royal family, where did they come from? If you go back through their family tree, to the Guelph Esters, where did they come from? Of course, they're from Venice. And the real goal of these elite banking families that stemmed from Venice was to get all of these countries heavily indebted, 
then to either get rid of the monarchies or to replace them with their own bloodline. So once you understand that meta narrative of what was going on in Europe at the time and what had been going on for many centuries prior, then all of a sudden you start to look at John Law in a different light. You start to ask questions. Who was this person really? And why did he have so many links and so many extraordinary things happen in his life that are not explainable unless there was somebody behind John Law who was manipulating the situation, ensuring that he got bailed out when necessary, but then he was indebted to somebody. Who was he really beholden to? So I put forward my evidence. That's my own personal theory. Like I said, I've not had anyone else put this out there before, but I think if you do some digging, if you look into this, my theory makes much more sense than the official narrative that John Law was just some speculator who somehow managed to bumble his way into the position of being the most powerful man in France for a few years, that is doesn't make sense. Now, as one final piece of evidence to support my narrative, I would give you this. Having left France, remember you had all of these noble families, all of these middle class and working class people in France absolutely bankrupted. They were wanting blood. They wanted John Law's head on a pike. So where did John Law go having fled France? Well, of course, he went to the place where he felt most protected, where he knew that he would be looked after and ensured that no harm could come to him. And that was Venice, of course. That's where John Law ended up in Venice. And nobody would be fleeing to Venice having done that in France unless they were almost guaranteed by the banking elites that lived in Venice that he would be protected and he would be okay. So that's where John Law went. That's where he lived out the remainder of his life. So again, I think this just adds further credence to my theory that all along John Law was working for the Venetian nobility. So one of the first things that we noticed about this time period where John Law came to France was the country, the nation, was already very heavily indebted to the banksters. King Louis XIV left them in an awful fiscal situation and therefore there was already a huge debt burden upon the country. Now the big problem with that is when you have a massive debt burden, you are now beholden to the people who funded the country, to the creditors, and France was now beholden to the bankers. So that made them extremely vulnerable to having someone like John Law come along and then all of a sudden say, right, I've got the solution because they were desperate, they needed something and John Law promised to fix it. Now, of course, it turns out that John Law was working for the very same banksters that had got them into that situation in the begin with. Although, make no mistake, King Louis XIV was not innocent. He certainly enjoyed racking up all those debts to live a lavish lifestyle. But again, that was because of the influence of the banksters. They wanted the monarchs to get indebted so they could eventually kick them out or replace them with a central bank who had complete control and the monarch would sit beneath them. So France was already very vulnerable. And that's really the first lesson I would take from this. When your countries are very heavily indebted, they are extremely vulnerable to corruption and the loss of sovereignty. And that's exactly what we've seen over the past 50 years in the West. We've seen a complete erosion of sovereignty. And now we have all these international organizations sitting well above our governments. And of course, above them sit the same banking cartels. And we've seen the constant impoverishment of the citizen because as the nation becomes more indebted, those citizens' rights are eroded even more, they're taxed even more. And that's what's led us to this situation now where essentially our nations are beholden to the military industrial complex, big pharma, and of course, the international banking cartels. So that's really the first lesson. When your country is heavily indebted, you are at real risk of being taken over by these international mafias. Now, the second lesson we can take from John Law's France is that artificially repressing interest rates does not work. Now, of course, we do not need to be told that because we have just lived through the exact same thing here in the West post 2008. The central banks took interest rates down to below 2%. But funnily enough, this is something that John Law advocated for way back in the 1700s, and that's what he did in France. He believed that if you took interest rates very low, it would lead to what? Well, of course, it would lead to increased asset prices. It would lead to healthy inflation, as he saw it. He told all the noblemen, if you let me take down interest rates to 2%, that will lead to an increase in the price of agricultural goods. And then the citizens will have to pay you more for your goods because they were the landowners. So they thought, oh, that sounds fantastic. Well, it's the same thing that we've seen in the West. He also believed it would lead to more employment because he said that there'd be more money circulating around, more credit in circulation, and that would mean more opportunities for people to get work because that would be invested in business. Of course, we know in reality what actually happens is people start to use that cheap credit 
for speculation and that leads to asset price bubbles. Now I think John Law knew this too. I don't think John Law truly believed that taking interest that low would fix the economy of France. I think he was doing that because that was the agenda. It was to get people to speculate, to build a massive financial bubble. Now it's interesting, isn't it, that this lesson was learned 300 years ago and yet they have just repeated the exact same thing here in the West. They took interest rates down to below 2% and what did that do? It led to a massive inflation in the price of assets. Of course, people were lending money to speculate on all kinds of things just recently. There were people taking out loans to speculate on cryptocurrencies and many people lost all their money and those bubbles are now starting to deflate. So taking interest rates down artificially to below 2% is short term gain for long term pain. And we have had interest rates so low for so long that we are in for an awful lot of pain. But of course, this is how a Ponzi scheme works. It has to suck in as much capital as possible. And if there isn't enough capital, well, you just print more and more of it until the scheme can go on no longer. And that's what happened in 1720. John Law's scheme could go on no longer because people started to redeem their money. They wanted their gold and silver back and all of a sudden it was exposed that the emperor was wearing no clothes. And that takes us to the next lesson, the next key takeaway from John Law's France, and that is printing fiat money, paper money that is backed by nothing, doesn't work. But of course, the nations of the West did not heed that warning, and after World War II, they dropped the gold standard entirely. We went on to the Bretton Woods system. Then the US played the exact same trick that John Law played. He said, this paper is going to be backed by gold, but towards the end of the 1960s, other nations became well aware that the US was lying about their amount of gold. They were printing more paper than they actually had to back it. Now, ironically enough, ironically enough, it was France that actually started to try to redeem their US dollars for gold. That is how they knew because they'd done it themselves. So they started to get their gold from the US and the US, of course, started to panic just like John Law did in the 1700s, realizing that it was going to expose that the dollar was not truly backed by gold anymore. So they closed the gold window, ended the Bretton Woods system, and ever since we've been on a completely fiat standard. Of course, we had the petrodollar. So using the petrodollar, the US has been able to kick this can down the road for a very, very long time and inflate the Ponzi scheme to astronomical levels, literally levels that nobody would have believed would ever be possible, but they've managed to do it. They've got us to this point, but it's all starting to fall apart, just like it did in 1720. It's 2023 now, and this current system is on its final legs. And what is the way out of this system? Well, if you look at this image in front of you, you can see what that is. We've got two to four quadrillion in derivatives and unfunded liabilities. Now, fortunately for France, they didn't have derivatives back then, but I'm sure France had some liabilities that were unfunded and they couldn't afford to pay. Similarly today, we've got 300 trillion in global public debt. Now I say public, they call it public because they try to make out like you and I are responsible for it. I'm not responsible for 300 trillion of public debt and neither are you. This is government debt. This is national debt that the central bank has ensnared our nations in. So we are not responsible for that, but they're going to put us on the hook for it. Similarly, there's 200 trillion in equities and bank deposits. This is things like deposits in the bank and pensions, things that will go bust when we hyperinflate the currency. On top of that, there's 120 trillion in government bonds. And to support all of that debt, we've got 40 trillion in paper currency. Or if you go to M2, we have 80 trillion. So 80 trillion to cover quadrillions in debt. Of course, the maths simply do not add up. Beneath that, of course, you've got real assets. The default risk is lowest in them, but even with land and commodities, they are usually attached to a country. They can be confiscated, mines can be nationalized, land can be seized. That's what's happening in Holland right now. So even those assets are not safe in the coming collapse. The only thing that is truly safe is something that has zero counterparty risk. And that is exactly why John Law tried to outlaw gold and silver because he realized that if people fled from the paper currency and went into gold and silver, the system would collapse. They'd be okay and the system would bear the brunt of the damage. He wanted to make the people bear the brunt of the damage and that is exactly what our governments want to do to us. They want to trap us in the system. They know that if people start to withdraw their money and realize what's happening and go back to real money, then they will be on the hook for it, not us. And their goal is to put you on the hook for it. So they're going to hyperinflate that currency. Most people are going to lose everything. They're going to lose all the bank deposits. They're going to lose their pensions. Any cash that they have will go to zero. And only a very select few people 
that prepared for the future are going to survive this. Now, towards the end of that, they may come for gold and silver. They may try to enact a confiscation, which is what nations often try to do when the financial system is falling apart. Of course, China and Russia and countries like this, they are preparing for the future, but our nations are not. Because what's really happened is they've taken John Law's France and just enacted that playbook once again. And this time we're talking about pushing money that has been printed into the stock market. That's what John Law was doing. He was printing up money and using it to push up the asset price of the Mississippi company. Well, that's exactly what we've seen since 2008. Remember, everything since 2008 has all been a mirage. The stock market died in 2008. So they printed all of this money. They called it quantitative easing. It sat on balance sheets, but it all went into the asset prices. If you add to that all of the share buybacks that took place because these companies were taking out cheap loans and using it to buy back their shares, if you took away those share buybacks, then what you would see is the stock market has gone nowhere since 2008. Literally, it has gone nowhere. It has all been an illusion. The house prices, the prices of your shares, people's pensions, all of it's been an illusion. None of that was real. It was all based on funny money. So the central banks knew this. They thought, right, we need to keep this Ponzi scheme going just a bit longer. Another 10 years, another 15 years, we need to come up with a solution, which of course we now know is central bank digital slavery, 15 minute smart cities. That's where they want to take us now. So they were trying to buy themselves time, but they haven't achieved their goal yet. And that's the most important bit for us. That's the rate of hope. It seems to me like this Ponzi scheme is going to collapse before they get to CBDCs. And that means we have a window of opportunity to get other people to actually see what is going on. And I think episodes like this will really help people to understand that nothing new under the sun exists. Everything that has been done to create the current Fiat Ponzi scheme has been enacted time and time again throughout history. Even quantitative easing is really nothing new. It's just been done in a different way, in a more complex system. However, it truly did exist back in the 1700s also. Debt monetization, of course, we've seen that many times throughout history. John Law was monetizing the debt. And what's happening right now in countries like America and the UK is they're starting to monetize the debt too. So that's it for today's show, everyone. I hope you enjoyed the first episode of my new series, The Road to Ruin. The next one, we will be looking at hyperinflation with France. So this really is a primer for what comes next in France. Later in the century, we have a hyperinflation and massive civil unrest that leads to the French Revolution. And that's going to be really important, that one, because that's going to show us the consequences of annihilating the wealth of thousands and thousands of citizens. What does that do to them psychologically and where can it lead to? So that's what we're going to be looking at next. We're going to be trying to figure out some practical advice, what we can take away to prepare ourselves for what might come next when we have our own financial collapse, which I truly believe is going to now end in a hyperinflation. If you want to support the channel, please check out my Patreon. This episode couldn't have been made without the support of patrons. They invest in the channel and that allows me to make more videos. Now, of course, I do offer my patrons all kinds of things over there. I do special articles. I also have a private Telegram group community where we help one another prepare for the coming hard times. And that's going to be key. Having a community is going to be absolutely vital. That's one thing I can say is certain from history. You need to have people to share information with, to discuss your own strategies, and maybe even give you advice as to where you can go in a bad time because we're not going to know exactly how this one is going to unfold. Also, I produce an audio newsletter and I also now give my patrons value alerts. These are alerts to things that I've been looking at that I'm going to invest in. So recently I gave a value alert on a company that I'd been watching for well over 18 months and it finally hit my buy zone. So I alerted my patrons to this, the people who were subscribed to my newsletter. Within three months, that investment was up 30%. This was a big company. It wasn't a tiny speculative stock. It was a major company, one of the largest in the world. And of course, we made the profit on that because we bought in at the right time. And then we sold at the right time too. Now, of course, this isn't investment advice. This is just me giving out my own personal research and analysis. And you can take that away and do with it what you want. So if you'd like to learn more about that, you can check out my Patreon. And of course, thank you to all my existing patrons who have enabled me to make this series. Without your support, I wouldn't be able to dedicate my time to making informative content like this. In closing, thank you so much for watching. Have a fantastic week and I will see you in the next one.